do we feel like there's the strong need to have a generalized AI? Is that um, just because we were trying to, I hate to say like be godlike, but like almost like be godlike where we can create a being like ourselves. And, you know, I don't know if that where that comes from. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy! Welcome, everyone, to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today we have Dave Mathias. Dave is a data and product coach and is the co-founder at Beyond the Data, an organization that is helping individuals and organizations move beyond the status quo by coaching and training teams to deliver amazing insights, products, and services. He is also the host of the Data Able podcast, a podcast that covers inspiring stories from real change agents, data champions, product champions, and data-driven leaders. Finally, Dave has been very involved in the local analytics community by being on the board of Mini Analytics and seems to always be out in the community, running conferences, meetup groups, and other events. Thanks, Dave, for taking the time to talk today. Great to you. Say, uh, you and I have talked a lot in the past. We've, we've been in this sort of tech community, and I, I know a little bit about your background, but may, maybe you'd be interested in sharing a little bit about what you've been working on and maybe the overall trajectory of your career. Yeah, so all over the place. Is <laughs> so somewhat <laughs> like yourself, right? So yeah. I consider myself in the, the tech community also, I also am in so many other communities that I feel like I don't know where I belong um, whichever day. But uh, like I tell people, I, I feel I'm a recovering chemist and a recovering attorney <laughs> um, uh, that became a product person that now has a couple of different entrepreneurial ventures more geared towards the intersection of, of data as cert- and analytics is certainly one of them, but also around customer experience, employee experience. And uh, certainly that is a, a core component along with product strategy and product alignment, things like that. Sort of that intersection of, of those things are really where I play a lot. Uh, certainly s- some of those things that I do, just like yourself over the years, we, we like being part of a community. One of the parts of being part of a community is bringing people together. Obviously, we're in these COVID times, we have a little less of the in-person uh, community. But at the same time, been a part of things like mini analytics, and which is a big analytics org here in town. We'll also uh, lead the product camp here in town, the product camp Twin Cities. I've started Customer Focus North uh, a few years ago. Yeah, you know, so so some different angles from an event side, and of course the meetups. You and I both run different meetups over the years, and right now I I lead both the Data Viz uh, meetup here in town and also the Data Fluency uh, meetup here in town. But then I also participate in many meetups like yourself. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, no, the Data Viz meetup is awesome, and I'll be sure to include links to all these meetups and organizations and stuff in the notes for the episode. And and you're also an entrepreneur, right? So you yeah. started your own your own company focused on data storytelling, or uh, well, how would you? Yeah, I mean, it's, certainly data storytelling is a part of it, but I, I would say it's more the digital and analytics adoption. The visualization data storytelling is a small part of uh, that whole adoption effort. So if you're going to uh, harness data more in your organization, everything from, you know, where do I start and how am I going to start approaching leveraging analytics to, and certainly like self-service analytics platforms like Tableau's or Power BI's or those types of, of platforms are certainly very popular. But then there's also efforts around, are you really looking to go down the very much the data science-y uh, route? And, and I say data science because I think there's these different terms that we use in different aspects and and people get very sensitive of this means this and that means that and at the same time you know if you're going to be more sophisticated and trying to build your own algorithms your own models at a more sophisticated level as opposed to repurposing more of what other people have done and, and doing slight tweaks to things or are you simply just trying to basically be more of a reporting type of system of data that you have so that you can understand you know what happened um, maybe dive into why it happened, but you may not be building up those predictive models or prescriptive models that would help predict in the future. You know, so it's sort of you know we work in different areas with with organizations. That's awesome. So are you? Do you find just to kind of dive in a little deeper? I guess are you finding that you're having to guide them through this journey sometimes, or you guys come in and they are very much like we need to do this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how do those typically go, or is it a little bit of both? Yeah. So bigger organizations have very experienced teams. They have a lot of great, great 
talent. Um, but when it gets to smaller organizations, it, it tends to uh, need more of that guidance uh, along that effort, whether they're just starting a route or whether they're, they tried uh, going down a route and now they're trying to readjust, right. um, which oftentimes happens. Oftentimes, uh, you, you hopefully are learning from your mistakes that we all hopefully learn from our mistakes. And I, instead of fail fast, you want to learn fast. And so, you know, how do you learn fast and, and you know, update and, and really start getting better value out of the data that you have? Good. Well, the one question I've been asking a lot of people that come on the, the show is sort of how do you define AI? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've thought much about it, but <laughs> I'm just kind of always curious to hear what people say when I say, you know, you could give it a quick elevator pitch, say, I don't know nothing about technology, nothing about the field. And I say, hey, you know, how, how would, I've heard this AI term. How, how, would, how would you define it, Dave? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question uh, and certainly a question that brings up a lot, a lot of different responses, I should say. It, it's interesting. So like there's the terminologies AI or I think machine learning has a, a little bit more um, agreed upon type of or similar, more similar type of response you get when you ask people machine learning um, versus data science, right? I think that the response gets a pretty broad, similar to AI, gets a pretty broad uh, level of re different responses, uh, let's just say. This definition is one that they basically use the machine learning type of de definition as AI definition, which is, you know, basically anything that can uh, program or like sort of write its own code. Like, I, I think that's a good one for, for machine learning in the sense that it's, it's learns from itself. But I think as soon as you start saying AI there, I think AI can be other things that can mimic a human side and other capacities. And that's why I do actually think RPA is not a bad, because in essence, you're, you're trying to use a way of saying, hey, the human is doing this normally. They normally grab data from the spreadsheet. Yep. They then put in the email or they put in the database or they whatever. And that's mimicking what humans do. Yeah, yeah, totally. And just mimicking what humans do is, is it, it, I don't know. I feel like it's not very intelligent, no. right? So yes, it is artificial, but it is not very intelligent. So what you really want to try and build is a system that gets better over time, that can optimize itself. Yeah. And this generalized versus specialized learning, yeah, the, the stuff that Andrew, Andrew Ng was, was sort of talking about is, is like, you know, we're not at a generalized level right now. Yeah. But I do think it's either chess or Go or like one of those things where they, I was reading a book on this where it taught itself, right? It basically figured out the rules based and it, they didn't, it wasn't human programmed. It was, it observed yes. all these various combinations and found out how it won. And what was fascinating was the the, the book had mentioned that over the course of entire time, People have been trying to figure out chess and master it, and this thing figured it out and learned it in four hours. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, it was fascinating, right? So how can you take that? And that's a very, again, it's very rules-based, so it's very simple to follow. But how yes. can you take that and build it into something that is, all of a sudden, this car can learn how to drive, mm -hmm. you know, for example, from an infant, you know, basically doesn't know anything. And four hours later now, it's basically racing around the track at, at 200 miles an hour. Yeah, so like you were saying that there is so many options in life in general, but there's so few in actually a game when we actually think of how many choices you get to make, whether it's chess or whether it's go or whatever it is. It's like, okay, you have a stone to place on a go board and you have X amount of squares. And yes, you place your first one where your starting point is, and then you see where there is. But there's just a, there is a calculatable type of problem where you can calculate all different outcomes and, and in essence, you know, can do that as opposed to saying, okay, if, if I'm using any type of hand gesture and I have a bunch of different settings behind me, I could be out and outside in a self-driving car that, you know, so how do I understand that that person means this or is doing this or like somebody is hurt and they're trying to flag down the car or they could be mm. doing, trying to point to something or they could be a blind person that's, you know, all these different aspects that become almost an unprocessable amount. And, and that, so how sure. do you... How do you make the best guesses, best calculations so that you can, and also have a, a level of safety as a pedestrian that's out there. And that, that's really, you know, it gets to the, the question of problems where you can like literally do the math and, and calculate everything versus there's going to be a, a strong level of, of unpredictability that we can't calculate out all the options yeah. and, and decide on. So how do we, how do we make decisions off that. And I think the better we get at that, the better, more we can move along that. And the more that we don't just have a computer system that is focused on just one task, but it's able to do like many, many different tasks, the more that gets people at least feeling like it's more generalized. But of course, to really get to that generalized level, you're talking just, you think of all the immense amount of things that we do as humans on a daily basis, right? So. Right, right. Yeah. Do you believe we'll get to that? level 
generalized AI at some point? I don't know. I mean, I I, I always like to think everything is it's possible. possible at some point. So so um, but I I do I think in my lifetime, no. I mean, I think certainly not in my lifetime. Now I do know I was at a a, a conference know, a couple of years ago. And I remember uh, the gentleman talking about cell phones and just about computing power. And he was giving the idea of computing power and where things are at when you to add up all the computing power around the world and how many brains worth of computing power there was. Like not storage, mental storage, but like just the, the ability to compute. Okay. Because there's always like the storage and the compute end, right? Right. And, and I think he said, and I of course, I'm probably going to quote the number wrong, but it was roughly... Um, I think by 2050, estimating that there was about 45 brains worth of compute power in a cell phone like size device. Wow. Well, now I think it was somewhere like, I think if we took all the computers in the world, or this is like a year, a couple of years ago, all the computers in the world, I think it was in the single digits or maybe maybe in the teens of computing power in the whole world. And so then if you're able to like say, okay, well, I have 45 human brains worth of computing power. And of course, like, doesn't mean that, as we know, like a computer can do certain tasks way better than a computer with just a lot less processing power. It's just really good at doing those small repetitive tasks. That doesn't mean that it like it doesn't take all of our brain power to do some of those, those things. But at least if you th if think in theory that we need to at least have the same or more compute power in a system to mimic, to have generalized AI, along with the storage in that system. And that the storage is already at that level where I think we're probably not that. I, I don't know what the, the current st stats on storage are, but the storage seems to be more advanced than on the uh, compute side. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure if you read much on neural nets or know about that, but and I'll probably get the stat wrong. In fact, I won't probably want to quote the stat per se, but <laughs> it was just phenomenal the amount of synapses we have in our brain mm -hmm. and all the connections that even the the most powerful computers, at least, uh, certainly not in in your hand, but there is a lot going on in your brain that we still have yet to understand. Yes. Right. And so we've tried to mimic it, I think, with a lot of mm -hmm. these mapping the brain into a neural network and figuring out, yes, it works in a lot of these cases, but there's things we still don't know about the human brain. Yeah. Yeah. We've just scratched the surface of, and, uh, and we, there's a lot of things we still can't explain. So mm -hmm. I guess I'm, I'm kind of with you in that uh, if we can't even explain the human brain hundred percent today, um, how can we say then that we're going to build a machine to replicate it in some way? Yeah, and I think the the challenge, of course, is is I think you know people a hundred years ago and would they have said where we are today? True. They they would have never imagined many of the things here. So that's where part of me just says is and the advancements, especially in the computing and all these. Even though obviously like the term artificial intelligence and all those things were coined, I think in the fifties, that you know it's not that these these things just sometimes take a while to develop, and and uh, I think. Even 20 years ago, we wouldn't have thought for the generally the ability to speech recognition and, and facial recognition, all these other types of things that we have at a very accessible level right now. So, so it'll be interesting to see what we can do. I mean, there's obviously a lot of fear on the generalized AI uh, realm, but do we feel like there's this this strong need to have a generalized AI? Is is that mm. is that um, just because we were trying to I hate to say like be godlike, but like almost like be godlike where we can sort of create a being like ourselves. And and you know I don't know if that where that comes from. It's awesome you mentioned being being godlike. I'm not sure if you uh, read the book called Sapiens. Yes. Yeah, and his second book, uh, I'm going to mispronounce his name, but he has a second book called Homo Homo Deus. Yes, I had the audio book. I have not finished that one to be honest. I maybe a third of the way through. Okay, well, it just fits very much in line with sort of what you were talking about. Um, and for anybody listening to this, if you haven't read uh, Sapiens, Homo Deus, and then he's got a third one out called 23 something for the 21st century. Really fascinating book. Okay, that's a good one too. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. But but in the second book, that's what the whole point is, is, is basically, you know, we've evolved from apes. <laughs> and now we're at the current state where we're at right now. And a, a lot of the questions is, is how come we got so far as far as we did? How come we were blessed with all these things like how come our brains evolved a certain way how come civilization and culture ended up coming together to where we are today and then really about like we are really pushing the envelope now on trying to become gods and in a lot of ways you know we rewind the clock back you know hundreds of years ago a storm would happen a volcano would erupt and people would point at it and say the gods didn't like us over time science has proven that there's not really these deities that are 
that are aiming to hurt humans and civilization. And now we're at the point of right now with human genomes, we're basically, you know, re-splicing and re redoing stuff. We're going to the moon, we're going to go to Mars, you know, I mean, you see all the stuff that's going on where we're basically rewriting the future. I and, mean, you know, honestly, in a lot of ways where if we didn't have this technology, we would have just been apes for the rest of, for the rest of time. And, and, and the, the, his, his book, I mean, obviously, you, as you've been reading it, it's, it's, it's not really a point of scaring people. He's really a historian, but it's really a fact of the matter is, is like we're doing stuff that, that mankind has never done before. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of biological, but it's also a lot of AI. I mean, it's, it's a lot of the things with regards to mind melding, right? There's, a, there's stuff going on where people are, I move my hand and it goes through my brain and it goes through the internet and it goes to you, Dave, and you move your hand, right? There's, there's a lot of really interesting things where they're crossing the bridge between, and, and I guess in some ways, you know, the more I'm sort of thinking about this is thinking about AI and its bridge into biology, because mm -hmm. that's where it can have a huge impact. Yeah, I mean, I, I think biology is another field where we're really at the infancy stage of, of really understanding a lot of these things. And so I guess the, the question is, and certainly I think there's, a, well, I'm no expert in the field of AI and being used in, in whether it's genetics or whether it's biology or any of those things, it does seem like there's at least a lot of uh, folks in those spaces that see a lot of opportunities in those. And and I guess the question is, is again, like, what is our purpose for using it in those spaces? Are we using it from a motivation just to make lives better, reduce poverty, reduce climate change, or those types of things um, where we want to make the world a certain way? Or are we trying to just recreate different type of ourselves. In Japan, uh, I forgot the statistics. I mean, there, there's a higher level of robotics in Japan than there are in the United States. And I forgot how many thousands of robots, but there were so many thousands of robots that were companion robots to people, oh, okay. as opposed to basically they were, they were a surrogate for a different, from a relationship perspective and like having, you know, that relationship. And I think of, um, I forgot, I think it was like Big Bang Theory or one of those, oh, yeah, Big, Big Bang Theory where one of the characters uh, sort of like almost fell in love with, his, with Siri on the phone, right? Mm -hmm. So what are we trying to satisfy with this, uh, with artificial intelligence is, is a big question. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I think humans are just curious creatures, you know, and I, I think, you know, a century ago, you'd say, why would you go to the moon? And, and I just, I think in a lot of ways, we're just curious to do that. So sometimes we just build things just for the sake of building them, I think, just to explore. But yeah, and the falling in love with the Siri, I, I was, uh, I, I, I have seen companion bets, you know, you know, basically people that have Alzheimer's or are, you know, in, in advanced age, they actually have uh, and it's more of an IoT device in like a lot of ways, but yeah, it's a it's a pet that they can deal with and talk to. It'll talk back, um, and it's like their own little uh, their own little companion. And maybe that's what yeah. you're getting at, where we can use electronics with basically intelligence, I guess, to keep them happy. Yeah, and I think there I think there was even a, a certain physical aspect and other things too, which is um, just trying to have an overall like what are the things that are part of a relationship. You know, so I think I think it is interesting because folks of our generation, uh, Data, you know, was a character in uh, Star Trek in yeah, that yeah. generation, and he was always trying to be more human, right? I mean, trying to you know mimic humans, and of course, there's also a lot of those negatives of certain human qualities, anger, rage, other things that like are not necessarily great qualities when they come out often. So you know, are we trying to create? better uh, beings than ourselves where we see flaws? Are we trying to just recreate ourselves? Are we trying to, you know, what are we trying to do? Um, another uh, movie that I like in that sort of sci-fi space is Ex Machina. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, yep. And and I think that's a, you know, they're trying to create the, the generalized AI that, that wants uh, obviously a, d a darker view of things, but. Yeah. What, what was the one movie where the guy, I want to say it was called like Her or something like, or maybe it was like, yeah, I mean, it is interesting. I mean, as we're thinking of like, like a thing like um, voice is, is become a bigger thing, right? Like uh, voice technologies, like whether it's a, a Siri or Alexa or uh, Google Assistant or things like that, right? And where they start really becoming much more popular, part of it was, the, you know, how good the language sounded from the, the device itself. But at the same time, how do we treat that? voice do we do we treat it as another person where we're asking a question or we're sort of having a conversation or are we you know is our behavior just like google search where you would just you know hey tell me this now and i want it quick as possible and so uh it is it is interesting how people interact with those types of devices 
as a proxy of you know where where this might go yeah yeah absolutely absolutely because yeah voice can be very um transformational in a lot of ways you know people people had thought that radio was going to die off because it wasn't as interface you know there wasn't a lot of visualization cues but radio is just as powerful now it feels like as it is ever mm -hmm. well and i think podcasts are another element of it i mean we're still humans we still have the same senses i mean people like to think we're, we're evolved and we're so much different than we were even thousands of years ago i i would tell people we're, we're pretty much the same right i mean we have <laughs> we have we have we have a little more legacy knowledge that we get to start with we have different technologies that we get more tools that we get to start with and, and access but we're the same genes we're the same our systems work the same we're so susceptible to viruses and to other things like that out there so if we're not that different and certainly one from a sensors sensory perspective you know sound or taste or those types of things are really strong emotional cues that we, we take in and why I think podcasting has done so well is because our voice is one of the more intimate, you know, senses for us to, you know, hear somebody's voice and, and you know, very distinct. Sure, definitely. Well, I want to bring it back a little bit to data, I guess. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is great. No, man, I, I, I love these conversations to go wherever they're going to go. And you mentioned about voice and you mentioned about I mean, we touched a little bit on the beginning around sort of storytelling. It, it feels like at the end of the day, you've got this ocean of data and what you've been doing in your career, at least most, most recently, is sort of helping businesses, A, make decisions on it, but then also maybe explain it better. And also have people stronger at being able to do that themselves, right? Like we're, we do a lot of stuff in the education space and a lot of, you know, teaching people how to fish as opposed to just doing the fishing, um, which is, I think, a core thing. And I think I would like to see more effort spent like that. I think part of it's just the nature of we're, we're always reacting to things. And I think how do you take a step back, you be more strategic and say, where do we want to go and what does it take to get there? It's it's easier said than done for organizations around because there's a lot of expectations and and I think Andrew Ng we were talking about before I think he does a good job for education wise his AI for everyone if you haven't uh, taken that as a person that's newer to this space definitely recommend you take that on Coursera AI for everyone okay and it's it does a good job of really laying it down at, at a like I think at a very basic level and and of course he goes into some of those concepts of generalized versus, you know, specialized AI and all those types of things. But just even thinking about what things is this type of stuff good at or what is it not good at? You know, when you talk about artificial intelligence, it's like, yes, there's certainly a big technical aspect. And you certainly, you know, if you're going to do neural nets, you need a lot of data generally. I mean, generally speaking, not, not all the time, but oftentimes you'll need a fair amount of data. And so there's certainly that aspect, but there's also a huge aspect of just understanding the domain and picking the right types of problems to go after, uh, no matter what you're doing and really finding value. I mean, even uh, the idea of like creating dashboards, like you can create a ton of dashboards, but you know, are those dashboards used? And are people actually taking action on those things? Are those actions what you expected those to be? And how do you sort of decompress that stuff from the start to minimize, again, learning fast as opposed to failing fast? How do you how do you quickly say, okay, wait a sec, we built this. This isn't getting the the, the action that we thought. We need to scrap this and get something else out there because you can't just stick a hundred dashboards in front of an average person and expect that they're going to be able to just like you can you know say hey these are the 100 metrics that you're going to be judged by they won't know what they're going to like what matters right we're people so you know how do you know each individual is going to say okay what's important to me from an incentives perspective as an organization how am i going to be judged whether you're in government whether you're a nonprofit whether you're a for-profit you're working in and so and even in your own life like i think of one of the better things out there from a uh, using a combination of they use data visualization but just even um, giving good insights is fitbit not just because it does a good job of, of using good visualizations and and you know, good practices like that, but it also gives good insights and thinking about, okay, here, what are the things that are important to me? Here's some insights like, okay, you're, you're on average sleeping this much uh, after you've worked out like this, like, have you thought of doing this? Like, and giving people those actual mm -hmm. insights and, and just thinking of like, whatever you're doing with data, taking a step back and saying, okay, what are we trying to do? Like, why are we collecting this? What, what are we hoping to get out of this? And how do we get people to you know, help us unleash that value. And while it sounds simple sometimes for people like, oh yeah, we're just going to like, we're just going to collect all this data. We're going to throw it into a machine learning model and it's going to like tell us the answer. Like that doesn't, it's not how it works. 
And so, uh, you know, really taking a step back at the early stage of playing. And it's, it's no different, to be honest, than a lot of things. Like the more you can, at the upfront perspective, start thinking about these things, start asking the questions. I like what Amazon, they, they do the whole practice of saying, okay, I, re- I write the press release at the beginning. Absolutely. You know, thought about it and at, at first, and you're trying to really figure out how do I unwrap that problem. Phenomenal. Yeah, totally, totally true. Complete. I completely agree. Kind of people that get so lost, they don't see the forest through the trees in some ways, right? So they're not, they're losing um, aspect of the big picture. And maybe that's a lot of what your current consulting work is, is keeping them focused on what the end goal is. Yeah, I mean, certainly the end goal is is the, I mean, and partly it's, it's just helping people also be better at thinking about that in themselves, like, and, and helping technical people be better people to work with the business side and vice versa and how the business people can have enough technical aptitude. I mean, because there's, there, there, there is a need for, for both sides of folks. And, and some people will say, well, we'll, we'll hire, you know, translators is a popular, more popular term that's been used like data translators and HBR. And some of those have, have talked about that. Um, but there's also a just, okay, like, you know, you can have technical people that can, you know, understand the domain and have the right ability to interact and, and do that. Certainly that doesn't work for everybody. And certain people are going to be better at that than others. I do think though, that business people should also be asked to have some basic knowledge um, around some of these things that are important around the technology. And and that's why, you know, product teams and other things are always encouraged to say, okay, you should understand you're going to be working with developers. You, have you taken a programming course before? Not that you need to be the programmer, but you should at least understand programming, understand some of the challenges, understand that things aren't as easy as as they seem. Uh, just like what kind of things have you done in the user experience space or other things? So that's like a, for a product manager. But if you're a finance person and you know who are, who are your stakeholders that you work with and have you sat in their shoes a little bit and had some exposure to what they've been you know, faced uh, with that you can better relate to them. That's great. That's great. Kind of makes you think about the value of a liberal arts degree in some yeah. ways, which is which is which is what I did. Yeah. Sort of getting multiple perspectives. So, well, I, I want to give enough uh, time here for you to promote your contacts. You know, how do people get a hold of you? Um, I know you have a, you have a podcast, of course, as well. If you want to mention any of that, maybe just now, how do people look you up online and, and find you and maybe connect with you? Yeah, the website is gobeyondthedata.com. You can also just connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm not on social media that much, but the platform I'm on the most is LinkedIn. And to be honest, I'm really not in any of the others anymore. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm Dave Mathias one on LinkedIn after the uh, linkedin.com uh, slash in slash Dave Mathias one. Feel free to reach out. I, I do do a fair amount of virtual coffees. I've been trying to do uh, more of that now with COVID. I've been doing interacting with people, trying to help, especially folks younger in their career. So if you're a person that's looking to to get into this, make a career switch, or are looking to you know accelerate your career, love to just grab a coffee with you virtually, and uh, we can chat. And like I say, there's there's a lot of uh, opportunities out there. I think there's a lot more opportunities for folks that may have some strong data skills, but also have uh, those those other skills too. So thinking about how you can uh, be more of a blended uh, blended person is good. Well, cool. cool. Is there anything else you wanted to finish? No, I, I, like, like, I appreciate the, as always, Justin, great to see you despite these interesting <laughs> times that we're in nowadays, uh, but no, appreciate uh, being on today. For sure, Dave. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at appliedai.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at appliedai.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.